uh, and the YoPlay launch that we've done in China. Um, my, my name is Peter Everett. I've worked with General Mills for uh, over 15 years. I've worked in a variety of different markets around the world uh, with General Mills. I'm, I'm American, so I started with General Mills in the U.S., um, but I've worked in Europe for several years, been back to the U.S., and now we've been in China for a few years to work on this launch and to prepare the launch for YoPlay um, here in Shanghai. And, and, and one thing that I've always heard when I've worked in different markets around the world, I've worked with the French, I've worked with uh, Portuguese, I've worked with Mexicans, I've worked with groups from around, the, around different markets around the world. One thing I've always heard from every, every group I meet is, my country is different. Uh, you need to understand, before you understand anything else, you need to understand that my country is different. Um, especially with the French folks I've worked with, they always tell me France is different. Um, when I'm in Mexico, they tell me, you know, the thing you need to really understand is Mexico is different. Uh, it's different from the U.S. In the U.S., of course, we don't really say the U.S. is different because for a lot of us Americans, we don't really realize there's a world outside of the United States. Uh, but when you think about China, I come to China, I've heard a lot of the same comments um, now that I've been in China for two years. China is different. And, and China is different. In a lot of ways, I think China is different. Um, but one of the main points I want to make today is it's different on a more superficial level, whereas on the fundamental level, I think a lot of the, thing, a lot of the lessons and a lot of the strategies and, and marketing approaches that we can apply are the same uh, as what we do in other markets, whether it's the US, France, or somewhere else. And I want to show you a little bit of how we've learned that and how we've seen that come to life in China in the last, uh, the last few years working on YoPlay. Um, so, let me give you first. Come on, there we go. Let me give you first a little bit of an introduction to YoPlay. Um, YoPlay is a uh, uh, number two yogurt brand worldwide. Uh, it was launched in France a little over 50 years ago. So it started in France. France is the home market, um, but it has expanded around the world from there. So you can see from the market shares across the across the pages uh, that in North America we have very strong market shares in key markets in North America. In Europe, we have strong market shares in the Middle East. Australia, we're a leader. Uh, and, uh, and starting to build a good market in, uh, in East Asia as well, with South Korea and now China. Um, now, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's actually a joint venture between General Mills uh, and Sodial. Let me talk a little bit about those companies so it helps you understand the background. General Mills is an American company uh, that's about, a, it's actually now this year, uh, 150 years old. We're one of the largest food companies uh, in the United States also with operations around the, around the world. And the brands that you might know from General Mills here in, uh, in China are especially Haagen-Dazs, haagen ice cream, and Wan Chai Ferry dumplings, Wan Zai Mato. Uh, so those are, our, those are our two biggest brands today, and we hope to add YoPlay to that list uh, as, we can, as we can build and grow the business. Uh, Sodial is the other partner in that joint venture. So Sodial is actually the, the largest dairy cooperative in France, and that's the group that launched YoPlay originally a little over 50 years ago. So we've brought their knowledge, their expertise of yogurt, brought it to China, along with the, the, the skills and the, the, the marketing and distribution that we have from Haagen-Dazs and, and Wanzai Mato, Wanchai Ferry, um, to, to start our success here so far in, uh, in Shanghai. And this is what we did. This is how we launched it at, at a starting point. So we had three product lines. Um, we wanted to have different products that met different needs for consumers, um, hopefully incremental needs. And on the left, you see, um, uh, and, and actually, I should, I should mention, these are all French recipes. So if you go to France, you can basically taste very similar, almost the same products. Um, Peril de Lay, on the left, is a very successful product that we have in, in France. Um, and it's been our most, uh, our most successful, our number one volume driver so far uh, here in China. Um, what you need to know about that is it's very rich, it's very creamy, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's um, a very high-quality product. Um, also, with this innovative packaging that we've brought to the market, we actually brought this packaging from the United States. With that format, consumers, it really jumps out at consumers because it's something unique and distinctive on the shelf. Um, second, we have oat fruit, which is a drinkable. So what we're trying to take advantage of here is we're trying to take advantage of the on-the-go um, opportunity, which is new and it's emerging and, and growing um, in the yogurt category. Um, and it's, it's fruit chunks. So if, you're, if there are any French uh, uh, people in the, cat, in the audience, um, this is Yope uh, from France. This is a product we call Yope. Um, but it has fruit chunks in it. So as you sip it out of the straw, these big chunks of fruit come shooting out at you uh, through the straw. Uh, and then lastly, we have Peigné, uh, Peigné de Fruits, uh, which is a fruit on the bottom yogurt. So the distinction and the, the innovativeness here is it's the first fruit on the bottom yogurt um, in the China market. Um, and it's 
also has done very well in terms of product development uh, and testing with consumers. So we launched these three products uh, last June, uh, so it's been almost one year now. And let me give you a little bit of a picture of the results. Um, and there are a lot of competitors in here, so we're the little red, we're the little red worm that's starting to grow, um, starting at zero in June and, and growing. Um, I have data here through January, and we're roughly a 10% value share in the category right now. This is, this is Shanghai data, because we launched in Shanghai as a, as a starting point, and we haven't, we haven't expanded to any other markets at this point. Um, but you can see we feel good about the results because uh, we have kind of entered this scrum of competitors that are roughly 10% value share. Um, so we still have a long ways to go. That's not, a, that's not a good end result for us, but it's a good result for the first few months. Um, and, and we've learned a few things. I think we still have certainly a lot, more, um, a lot more details to learn, a lot more things to learn about the category and how we can take advantage of the opportunity in the category here and grow the category with consumers. Um, but we've learned a few things, and I want to share a f just a few of the things that we've learned um, today to give, you some, uh, to give you some idea of how I think China is actually not different uh, uh, versus other markets. Um, the first point uh, that is important is, you know, even on global products, you need to generate local insights. And our, um, our strategy at General Mills and, and in YoPlay is we have great global products. So we want to take those products um, that might exist in other markets like France and find ways to identify which of these can we bring to China. So we're not trying to create new products necessarily. We're looking at what do we already have and how can we bring them to China. But that requires local insights. And that is actually, that is one thing that's actually common across all markets is we need to, we need to uh, develop those local insights. You'll see it on Peril Delay. I'll show you an example of how we do that. Um, and I'll also explain a little bit of the process of how we get there. Um, second, we need to build categories to find new sources of growth. And this is something that as I've been in China for a few years, I've become more passionate about. Uh, because when you see the nature of competition in China, it's different in every category, of course. Um, but in the nature of competition in China is such that a lot of times competitors are competing against each other rather than building new categories, or building new segments to build their categories. And I want to show you how that, how that looks in the yogurt category. And then lastly, you need to generate, we need to generate real consumer value in, in China's new normal. So we talk a lot about new normal. It's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. But we can still drive growth in that new normal, even if the economy is slowing a little bit and the nature of uh, consumption might shift. We can still drive growth. And in yogurt in Shanghai, the growth is actually accelerating right now. And that's because there's, there's real value that's being created for consumers. Not just by YoPlay. There are other brands that are doing it well as well. Um, but there's real value that's being created for consumers. So to, to understand the first point, to talk about local insights, uh, you need to understand a little bit about peril delay and a little bit about the category. So let me, let me start by explaining a few things about the yogurt category uh, here in China. The, the first is most yogurts are very thin. Um, actually, in, in, in Shanghai, 70% of the yogurt uh, is consumed either through a straw or, or you drink it somehow. Um, so, you know, compared to France, that's a very different market compared to France. So it's very, it's very, th uh, um, uh, very thin products um, and, and highly strawable. Um, so a spoonable yogurt like this is quite different. And Peril Delay is very thick. The differentiation, one of the key differentiations of this product is, um, as you can see in our advertising, is we, you, can, you can actually hold a spoon upside down and the product will stay on the spoon. That's how thick this yogurt is. So it's very different. Um, another key point of difference on this product is, um, and as all of our products, is it's 100% fresh milk. So consumers in China have a big concern about milk and milk quality. And having worked in different markets, I've never seen somebody ask so much about the ingredients and the nature of the ingredient and where it comes from. Um, it's something that's very top of mind for Chinese consumers. And this product is made with 100% fresh milk. So it's something that we can leverage uh, in, our, in our communication. So let me show you, but, but those things... Those things are still generally true in France. It's the same, this product is the same product as the one we sell in France. So the same product attributes are generally true uh, in France, um, but the, the insight in France is quite a bit different. And I'm going to show you a little bit of, uh, of the advertising for these products to give you a feel for how that looks. Um, the thing you need to understand about the French market um, is the French market, the consumption of yogurt in, in France is about 25 kilograms per capita, roughly. Um, consumption in, in Shanghai is about seven kilograms per capita. So that's, that's still fairly, that's, that's a still a fairly high number, but obviously much less than France. So France is a much more developed market, and French, consume, French consumers generally will consume yogurt three times a day, morning, noon, and night. And so the way we've positioned Peril Delay in France and the way we communicated in France 
um, is much more targeted. So let me show you uh, the ad. Doctor, je voudrais comprendre ma femme. Il va nous falloir plusieurs séances alors. Tous les soirs, elle vient se coucher cinq minutes après moi. Qu'est-ce qu'elle fait Vous comprenez quoi vous Vous savez, dans la journée, une femme a un milliard de choses à faire. Alors oui, le soir, elle a besoin de cinq minutes. Cinq minutes de pure douceur. Et pour cette douceur-là, il n'y a que perles de lait. Perles de lait, c'est si doux. C'est un plaisir nature incomparable. Tant qu'on n'a pas goûté, on ne peut pas comprendre. Perles de lait, essayez cinq minutes de pure douceur. Uh, so it's, it's very much, it, this is a micro-targeted product. It's very successful in France. The market share in France is quite strong. It's a very, in, in France, of course, it's a very competitive market with a lot of different products. Um, but uh, this is a, it's a very successful product. Um, the, this ad is probably the most French ad you can possibly imagine uh, in the yogurt category. I don't know if anyone has been to France before, but there are so many insights into French psychology in this ad. I love it. Um, but uh, it's, it's a micro-targeted spot. It's talking about that five minutes at the end of the day when you can have this product. So it's very specific. They're giving us the, we're giving you the, the, the moment, how to use it, when to use it, and, and it has a very specific benefit to it. Now, let's watch the version that, we run, that we've used to launch the product in, uh, in China. 每一个小小的快乐都是法国的味道。就像一勺优诺法式酸奶，百分之百生牛乳，融合水果的浓醇。当优诺来到中国，尝得到的法式心情，现在也属于你。优诺酸奶，清爽一勺法国风。it's, it's obviously an introductory ad. That's not the point I'm trying to make. It's obviously talking about a new product that's just come you know, from France to China. That's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is the insights of the very same product, but the insights that we apply to the Chinese market are quite a bit different. It's not talking about five minutes at the end of the day, uh, which is relevant for someone who has yogurt three times a day and has it you know, for different occasions throughout the day. It's, it's very general in terms of when you might have it or how you might have it. It's much more a story about taste and texture uh, which is the thickness and the taste experience of it, as well as uh, the quality. We talk about 100% fresh milk, and uh, you know, we, in our marketing, we haven't yet gotten too far in terms of more of that quality story, but there is a very strong quality story behind YoPlay and, and the, the standards that we use. Um, so same product, very different insight. And how do we get there? So we talk about, um, in, in General Mills, we talk about using global products, but applying local insights. Um, there, there are some new ways that we're using to get to those insights. Um, the first is we, get, we try to get one-on-one -on -one with consumers. So we're, we're, we're doing less and less focus groups. If you still do focus groups, I think focus groups are slowly going, uh, are slowly going away. They're slowly going to disappear. Um, and the reason for that is you can see in the pictures that we have here, uh, we have our people uh, going one-on-one -on -one with consumers. Um, and sharing prototypes with them, sharing ideas with them, getting feedback one-on-one. -on -one. In the picture there in the upper right, um, that's our R&D director who's talking to consumers. Um, we don't, you know, we're using less and less focus group moderators. We're using our R&D director to do it, or our marketing director, or even finance is getting involved. It's our team that's working on this. And the reason for that is when you discuss one-on-one -on -one with a consumer and you share a prototype with them, you get much stronger feedback, and you're able to ask them questions that get you to a much deeper insight. And then when the team leaves that interaction, they feel in their gut why that product is different or what the differentiation of that product needs to be to make it successful. The second point here is this process is really fueled by prototypes. We use more and more, we use prototypes uh, instead of sharing you know, a, a two-dimensional uh, concept on a sheet of paper or a, a, you know, a doing concept tests on the internet or things like that. Um, the reason for that is what we've found is, especially the more you're trying to do something new, the more you need to give something consumer, you need to give consumers something to react to. You need to give them something tangible that they can react to. And if it's tangible, even if it's something totally new that they've never had before, they can give you very good feedback. If it's a, if it's a two dimensional sheet of paper, it's very difficult for a consumer to give you strong feedback. And then the last point at the bottom is uh, this iterative approach. So when we do these kinds of interviews, actually we assume that the first time we do the interview for a new product or a new project or something, we assume we're going to get it wrong. We assume it's not correct, but then the, the, the trick is we need to learn why it's not correct 
and iterate and make it better and continually improve it. So depending on how complicated the, proje the project is that we're working on, we might talk to consumers two times or we might talk to consumers five times, but we go back and back uh, until we feel like we have it right. So this is the first, for us, this is the first uh, lesson that, that we think we've learned as we've launched YoPlay in China is it's global insights, but, or it's, sorry, it's global products, but applied with local insights. Uh, and in that sense, China is not different. That's something that we are doing across all of our, uh, across all of our markets. Um, this, the second point I think that's really important is um, whenever we're working in, in whatever the category is, in our case it's yogurt, um, we need to determine how mature is this category and how can we develop it. And yogurt in China, if I just take the Shanghai example, the consumption of yogurt in Shanghai is actually about the same as the consumption of yogurt in the United States. So it's actually relatively high. If you take all of the country, of course it's less. But Shanghai, it's high. Beijing, it's high. The tier one cities, it's, it's quite developed. But the thing that strikes us as we look at the category is there are some very strong basic benefits, um, but not a lot of segmentation. So on the left, you have the, a, a, a hero product from Denon. Um, they've launched this product several years ago. It's been very successful. And marketing behind products like that have really helped build a benefit of digestion in the category. So if I go out on the street today in Shanghai and I ask a consumer, what's the main benefit you get from consuming yogurt, I, I guarantee 90, at least 95% of them will tell me uh, it's, about, it's about digestion. So that's great. The category has a strong foundation, but we haven't built beyond that foundation very much. Um, there's also a lot of Me Too innovation. So I put one example up there. I think there are many examples that we see in the category. Uh, but what will happen is one company launches something, and I think historically in China, the last 10 to 15 years, we've developed a mentality of expansion. If there's a market that's growing, we just want to get into it. So we just expand and expand. Um, not, necessarily having, uh, not necessarily with mentality of how do we grow a, grow a category with new insights. And so you see a lot of Me Too innovation. And that's understandable, especially where China has been in the past, I think it's very understandable. And it can be a very successful strategy. And even in the future, of course, I mean, to be realistic, we know competitors are going to compete, and if somebody does something good, the other competitors are going to try to figure out how to, how to do that same thing. But that's not growing the category for, for consumers, for our customers, and, and eventually for us. Um, we need to think beyond that to create more, uh, more new innovation that can drive new segments. Uh, so let me go back to the example of France and China. And uh, I can see the labels got a little bit cut off on the bottom here, but the left-hand side is France, the right-hand side is China. And this is a simplified segmentation. Um, obviously, we could go deeper than this, but the general trend is, 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 always holds true, which is if you look at the French segmentation, uh, the French category is, is much more developed, has a lot more benefits uh, than the Chinese category. And again, we still think the Chinese category, at least in the tier one cities, the consumption is quite high, but the number of benefits is quite limited to the consumer. So if you're, if you're a consumer today and you go to a Carrefour, for example, uh, there's a big shelf, but the products are all doing very, you know, different shades of the same benefit. Um, that's an opportunity for us to, uh, to get beyond. And, and that's something that we've been trying to focus on as, as we've launched YoPlay here in, in China. Um, and, and it's working. If you look at the left-hand side, um, this is the growth rate of fresh yogurt in, in uh, Shanghai over the last, uh, last couple of years. And uh, what I think is interesting, and, and, and by the way, it's not just us. Like, we are helping to grow the category. We're pretty confident in that. But there's a lot more growth that's going on than just, uh, than just, uh, than just YoPlay. Um, but where the growth is coming from is it's coming from the brands and the products that are bringing new benefits to consumers. Um, so the, the, what I think is interesting here is, you know, we talk a lot about how China is slowing down, the economy is slowing down. Um, but what's happening is actually in the fresh yogurt category in, in Shanghai is it's accelerating. Uh, and that's because of the, uh, the innovation that some of these uh, competitors have brought. So we need, in, in, in summary, the second lesson, we need to find ways to build new segments to the categories. We see it works even when the, even when the economy might be slowing down. It can drive a lot of growth for us. And the way we do that is not through Me Too innovation. It's by finding new jobs that need to be done for consumers. In General Mills, we talk a lot about jobs because, um, you know, in the old world, we used to talk about... Um, targeting a product to a 25-year-old woman, or targeting a product to a mom with three kids, or targeting a product to a 55-year-old, um, you know, uh, older, older adult. Um, we don't really do that anymore, because what we've learned is what's, what's less important is age, income, you know, maybe ethnicity, those sorts of things. What's more important is understanding the job that the product does. 
Um, the world is getting more and more fragmented in a, in a variety of ways. Um, but the thing that holds true is this product, like Peril Delay, for example, does a job for consumers that's unique from the other jobs in the category. So we focus on those jobs, and we try to find new jobs um, that we can do in the category. And then also to find new consumers. So even, in, even if we have high consumption and relatively high penetration in Shanghai, there are a lot of consumers who are not really participating in the category. Um, and there's an opportunity for us to go after that as well. So I think this is a lesson. This obviously is, a, is coming from our experience in yogurt, but I think it's a lesson that applies across a variety of categories. And then the last point, uh, the last thing that we've seen in, the, in, the, uh, in, in, our, in our research so far is even with the new normal, even with the economy maybe slowing down a little bit, consumers are still willing to pay for value. And if you offer them value, um, they're willing to pay a higher price. So this is a very generalistic chart on the category. But in general, the products on the left and the history of the category has been more products that are generally priced around 2 to 6 RMB per, per serving. Um, that's, that's interesting. That's kind of a wide range. If I compare it to my experience in the United States, usually price, the price range within a category is much narrower. Um, but over the last few years, what's happened is there have been some new competitors that have been launching more premium products. And if we take um, the, these four products, so two of them are Yoplait, two of them are our competitors, um, but these, these four products have been driving actually quite a bit of growth in the category. And they're priced at two to three times the category average. So to give you an idea, like the, the category average right now in Shanghai is about 22 RMB per kilogram. And the products on the right are generally priced around 50 to 60 RMB per kilogram. So it's a much higher price point. And I have to tell you, as an, as an American and, and having worked in Europe, you generally don't see that sort of significant gap in price um, in our categories and other markets. When you come to China, um, you know, the reason those products are more expensive is they're using really significantly higher quality ingredients. Um, they've got different, uh, you know, more differentiated packaging, things like that, that helps them, helps them to drive value for consumers. Um, and so there's a reason for that price gap. But consumers are willing to pay for that extra price if they see that there's a tangible value in it. And some of these products on the right, um, you, can see that, uh, you, can, you can see that they are. And um, McKinsey shed some interesting light on this recently. There was a report that came out. Uh, perhaps you've seen it. If you haven't, I suggest you take a, take a look at it. Um, this is one chart that I, I borrowed uh, from, the, from the McKinsey presentation, which is about consumer confidence and consumer maybe gives us a little bit of a hint on consumer willingness to pay. Um, so, you know, in general, China, you know, consumer confidence about their household income, will my household income increase over the next few years, is higher than the U.S. or the U.K. That makes sense. Um, but I think the more important story here is that on the left, between 2012 and 2015, they actually haven't seen a huge shift uh, in consumer expectation. Um, and consumer confidence in general, especially in the Tier 1 cities, from what we see, it seems like it's holding up pretty well. Now, I do think it's getting. It, I do think that's something we have to watch. I think over time, as we see the economy continue to to, to move the way that it's moving, um, we need to be careful on this um, because it can change over time. But right now, consumers are still willing to pay. And what we see in the yogurt category is the, is proof that if we drive real value for them, the 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 the, the willingness to pay is still there. Um, uh, I see, uh, the CEO of um, P and G recently had an interesting comment that I. I, 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 I wanted to share with you that I think was a very interesting insight into what's going on right now and why, why there's this willingness to pay. Um, you know, sometimes, I know certainly from the U.S., we think about China as a developing market. And China, you know, and, and on a lot of measures, in a lot of ways, it is a developing market. But it's also a market where you have some of the most discerning consumers in the world. And what's really critical to, to innovating and being successful in today's market in China, I think, is to be able to understand the difference and to be able to, to understand when, when consumers really are discerning, what are the measures on which they, they really care, and how can you drive meaningful differentiation. And, and P&G has recently had some, some challenges, I think, in China. And the reflection from the CEO was just that, that, hey, we weren't recognizing that these consumers have very high standards. And they're willing to pay if we deliver on those high standards, but you have to deliver on those standards. Um, and, and, this gives us another, stand, another look at it. You know, I was saying earlier that we focus a lot on jobs to be done. We don't focus so much anymore on demographics or income levels or things like that. And this was an interesting um, confirmation, I think, for us so far that it's really about the value that we're driving for consumers. If you look at the, the chart on the left, this is data from Kantar, which talks about um, the volume purchased uh, by, in, by different income levels, uh, volume of yogurt, of course, 
purchased by different income levels in Shanghai. And on the left is the total category, on the right is Yoplait. And we actually over-index a little bit uh, versus, uh, versus the total category on the, on, uh, the lower income levels. Um, and I, I, that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to target Yoplait to lower income levels in Shanghai, but I think it's an interesting indicator that it's not just about income. I think in the, in, in the past we would have said, okay, let's target our, most, our highest income consumers because that's where our, all our growth is going to come from. Um, what we're seeing here is that there's a variety of consumers who are willing to pay for even a more premium product as long as the value is meaningful for them. So I think the question then becomes, how can you offer tangible value to consumers? We need to really work hard to understand that. Work, talking one-on-one -on -one with consumers, prototyping with consumers, and finding new jobs for products to do. Again, I go back to the example of the yogurt category. I think up until a few years ago, the yogurt category basically did one job for people. Um, even though it's big, it's been doing one job. Uh, now what we're trying to do is find ways to create more jobs for this category to do so that we've got differentiation uh, uh, against, uh, against new areas. And when you think about, obviously, in, in food and beverage, a lot of times we talk about that sort of really basic trinity of taste, health, and convenience. In the past, the category has been doing health really well. And it hasn't been doing taste, and it hasn't been doing convenience. And, of course, we could go and we could talk to consumers about the current products, and we could, tell them, we could ask them, how do you feel about the taste of the current products? And actually, we did that a little bit. And they told us, yeah, the products we have today taste good. And we could ask them about convenience as well, and we did a little bit of that as well. And consumers told us, yeah, the products today are pretty convenient. But then when we showed them the prototypes of some of the new products we were coming out with, um, they really responded to the taste and also responded to the convenience of some of these products. So, you know, on a very basic level, I think any food category, you can look at taste, health, convenience as a starting point. And then if we use the French example, um, the French category on some level gives us some inspiration for what are the future segments, what are the future jobs that, uh, that the category can do for consumers. Um, so I, I, I think that's where we're trying to go. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve problems for consumers. Uh, we, we, when we talk about jobs, that's about solving problems or providing a new experience for them. They may not know that they want or they may not know that they would appreciate, but when they see the prototype or they see the product, they immediately respond to it. And so I've, I've tried to share with you a few ideas, a few thoughts, and a, a, a few numbers from what we've seen from our launch. So um, it's, that's kind of nice. It's some nice theories and some nice, uh, some nice numbers. Um, what really matters to us at General Mills and YoPlay, we talk about we serve the world by making food that people love. And this is a picture. It's a little bit grainy because it came, it came from a consumer via WeChat. Um, but uh, this is a picture that for us, this is the proof of what we're doing. We're making products that consumers love. And that's, what we're, that's how we're going to grow the yogurt category, um, hopefully grow our business over time. And I think this is the opportunity for all of us as we think about how we can, uh, how we can grow our brands and our categories. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, let's say a few words about Peter. Peter is the um, SBO director of uh, Yopan China, CMO of Greater China General Mills. He has 17 years of working experience with General Mills, and he has worked on different positions. He came to Shanghai in 2014 and uh, prepared for your plans launch in the Chinese market. Feel free to ask any questions. I have a question. It's a rather simple question. Now, in terms of shelf life for yogurt and its seasonality, if you do e-commerce, now summer is not a good time for the transportation of yogurt. So if you want to sell yogurt for e-commerce, how can you address the problem of seasonality and shelf life, low shelf life for e-commerce? Yeah, that's a good question. And obviously, e-commerce, everyone is paying a lot of attention um, to e-commerce today in China with the, the fantastic growth rates that we have in some categories. In yogurt, based on the numbers that we have, that we see, uh, the, the category is still relatively low in terms of growth rates in e-commerce, maybe low single digits, or low, uh, yeah, that's right, low single digits. Um, 
but it's something that we're starting to explore. Uh, in, in summer, it's not, in the big cities, it's not really that much of a problem because the cold chain has become more and more developed. So, um, of course, it's more expensive for us than to develop, than to deliver an ambient product because you have to have uh, trucks that are equipped to maintain the right temperature. And we spend a lot of time and attention on uh, the temperature of those trucks and how we can maintain the temperature of those trucks over time. Um, but it's, it is, it's, it's something that we're able to do. Um, we're also working with uh, consumers to try to understand when they when they are um, when they're buying over e-commerce. I, I think it's a different purchase occasion. It's a different way to purchase, and it's a different mentality. Um, so we probably need to optimize the, the the product offering either through the packaging or through uh, uh, through other means um, to make sure that it's something that's uh, that it's targeted to e-commerce. Thank you. Uh, hello, Peter. Thanks very much for the speech. Very inspired by the uh, great performance of this product um, uh, in China, but um, especially in Shanghai, because uh, I, I think most of us has been, uh, have found this product very conveniently available in the CVS channel. So uh, I have two questions uh, for this product particularly. Um, first one is, what is the channel strategy for this product to go um, further develop in China? And the second one is, um, I, I realized that um, uh, from the two TVC you just showed, uh, the TA, um, you've been chosen for the China market versus the French, uh, versus the one in French is quite different. So what is your understanding of the um, target audience you have in China. Why are you targeting, it seems like, to be quite different from the French? Right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, so uh, the court, first question was about channel strategy. And, you know, basically our channel strategy is yes. Um, we want to be in all channels. Uh, we want to have broad distribution in channels, and that's because we're, we are trying to meet consumers where they want to meet, where they want to buy our products. Um, you mentioned the convenience channel. Um, and CVS is a big uh, growth engine. I, I think it will be a growth engine for us in the future. I think it's also a growth engine for that category. We see a lot more consumers shopping in more convenient formats, whether it's CVS or smaller supermarkets or you know, places like that. Um, so that's definitely an area for us to be. And if you look at our products, our products, the, the mix of what we sell uh, varies a little bit. So a higher percentage of the drinkable product, um, O fruit. Um, we sell a little bit more in CVS compared to the other products, which is natural because it's an on-the-go product and, and it lends itself very well to that occasion. Um, but we're not focused on one channel. We're trying to drive growth in, in all channels. Um, then the second question about the target audience. Um, the target audience, I think it is different uh, from, uh, from the French example. I think the biggest reason that it's different, it's not, like I was saying, it's not about demographics. It's not about um, identifying a certain income level. Uh, or things like that. It's about, it's about identifying and understanding the mentality of the consumer and what does the consumer want a new product to do for them. And in this case, the, 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 the mentality of that consumer is it's a consumer who's looking for a higher experience, looking for a taste experience, I mean, on a very simple level. Um, she's looking for a product that, that tastes great um, and is maybe not satisfied with what the category is offering today. And like I said, you can't, we can't go to her and ask her, are you satisfied with the taste of the category today or not? Because generally they'll say yes, um, but when we took them this product, Peril Delay, um, they, it clearly was a differentiator uh, versus everything else that was in the category. Um, so it's more of a, I would say it's more of a mentality as opposed to a demographic, and the mentality is about um, looking for a premium experience, um, really focused on taste, wanting to have a high quality product, and also interested in the quality of the ingredients, the quality of how the product is made. Um, thanks for the speech. It's very good. So I have a question is more on the um, trends because you've been talking about um, the um, flavors, indulgence, and also convenience and benefits to consumers. Um, but we also know for dairy products, there's another um, important thing about nutrition. But um, at least from what I see, I think your play um, is actually playing the fun and also flavor um, product offering to consumers. So. What's your view on the um, nutrition? Is it something that is um, um, less relevant to um, this product, particularly at this stage? Or uh, what's your place um, on going um, strategy on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. And, um, you know, it goes back to what we were saying about the category. The category already has strong health credentials. So consumers look at the products they buy today, and they know that those products are healthy. They know that they have a digestion benefit. They know that there's calcium, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, and our, our products have the same. I mean, our products are made with 100% fresh milk, so we have the same calcium levels. We have live and active cultures like our competitors. Um, but the difference is we chose to not talk about them. And actually, if we go back to that example of the launch um, TV spot that, that we use, um, of course, you know, at the beginning, there's a little bit of discussion because every competitor in the category, if you look at the advertising of basically every other competitor in the category, they talk about live and active cultures and the probiotic cultures. Um, so for us to say, okay, we're not going to talk at all about cultures in our TV spot was, I think, a little bit of a shock at the beginning. Um, but as we saw how consumers responded to it, uh, they, they know it's important. So in summary, you know, our, our, we think our products have a lot of the same health credentials and, you know, uh, of, of a lot of the other competitors. Um, but it's not about communicating that health. It's more about communicating on, on other benefits. Thank you. Hey, hello, Peter. I'll ask two questions. The first question is a long-term question. Like I have two Hello, I've got two questions. Uh, I've got two kids. I'm a father of two kids. So do you, what recommendation do you have? A recommended monthly dosage of uh, yogurt for little kids. Do you have any recommendations? Is there a scientific level of uh, U-plate consumption for kids? Uh, I live in Beijing. Can my children enjoy your, your yogurt now or soon in the future? My second question is dairy products or milk-based products. The major determinant of its quality is uh, its raw material, namely the milk. There, that's why the Chinese consumers are concerned about the quality of the raw milk. So how different are you in the quality of a raw milk you base your products on? You talk about 100% fresh milk. Anything else to make your product stand out product-wise, uh, quality-wise? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, so the first question about kids, I don't, I don't think we have a scientific recommendation of how often your kids can have your play. I would say as often as possible. Uh, is fine. Um, my kids have it at least twice a day, so that seems to be working well for them. Um, and we're not in Beijing yet. Of course, you know, Shanghai is our starting point, and that's been our, our test market. Um, of course, long term, we want to expand, but we're not into Beijing yet. So we'll hope to, except for Sam's Club. We're in Sam's Club right now in Beijing. So if you go to Sam's Club, uh, which is the club store format of Walmart, uh, you will find us there. Um, on, the, on the second question about the milk, um, it's a good question. And, you know, they, this is an interesting thing where with consumers, we need to find a very simple way to communicate the quality of the milk and to signal the quality of the milk. Um, because if we get deep into the technical explanation, we're going to lose them and it's not going to mean anything. So that's why we've chosen to focus on 100% fresh milk. There are a variety of different things that we do in terms of how we handle the milk um, that, uh, that I think are different and unique versus what our competitors are doing. Um, but the most tangible one and the one that, that signals the most to consumers is 100% fresh milk. So that's why that's the one that we choose to talk about. Um, more generally, of course, we're doing a lot more than that. So we have um, um, Sodial, I mentioned at the beginning, is the joint venture partner um, uh, along with General Mills in YoPlay. And we leverage Sodial a lot. So Sodial is a dairy cooperative. That means Sodial is a collection of French farmers who are pooling their milk together um, to sell it on the market. So Sodial has over 50 years of experience working with French farmers on how to create the highest quality milk and how to manage the distribution of it and, the, and you know, making, all the way to making products like yogurt and cheese. Um, so everything they do in France, we're applying the same process that we have here um, in China. And we have a variety of technical measures that we measure the quality of our milk on. And you know, the interesting thing is if you compare the quality of our milk here in China to the quality of the milk that we get in France, it's, it's very, very similar. Uh, and uh, in, in some ways it's even better. Uh, so the quality of the milk is very high and I think it comes from working very closely with the suppliers, um, having a very long history of knowing you know, how, how to manage the quality of the milk um, and then w following it on a daily basis. We have a team um, that uh, works in our supply chain team that is 100% focused only on milk and that's all they do. 
Thank you for the question. Um, oh, no thanks, way. Peter. It's a great product, and I can feel that it's very successful in China because uh, friends around me also love this product. But as you mentioned, it's now only a launch test market in, in Shanghai, and you may ro roll out to Beijing and uh, Guangzhou, like big cities. But from long-term point of view, what do you think about lower-tier cities? What's your brand strategy? Do you also want to um, go down to the... Because, you know, the great potential in China is really in the tier two, tier three, or even lower tiers. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 um, you'll play. You know, of course, long term, our, our 10 year, 15 year view, um, it's not exclusively a tier one city sort of product. Um, there are, and 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 right around us, you know, in Jiangsu Province, Zhejiang Province, um, obviously there are consumers who really value a product like this as well. So we'll start to expand. I can't say that we have any firm plans, or I can't tell you what the plans might be. Um, but uh, you know, of course, longer term, that's something that we think. That we're, all, look, all of the same rules that we talked about here apply to people in Nanjing or in uh, Wenzhou or in Wuhan, just the way they apply to people in Shanghai or Beijing. Now, it might be that the category is not quite as developed, or in some cases the cold chain might not be as developed, um, and you know maybe the retail uh, environment is not as developed. But as those things develop, I think these same rules apply, and we'll be we'll be looking forward to that opportunity. Okay, one more question. Uh, uh, hello, I have a question. Thank you. My question is, you played in the category of uh, yogurt. Are you developing or are you planning to develop a low sugar uh, yogurt? Do you offer low sugar uh, yogurt? If the answer is yes, do you consider the addition of uh, sweeteners or additives? What's your take on including sweeteners and additives to your products? Thank you. Um, so the, 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 the first way that we address that is we address it by the taste that consumers want. Um, and so our products have been developed closely with consumers, giving them prototypes, telling, uh, telling us, among other things, what is the sweetness level that you want. Um, in the product and trying to optimize to that sweetness level that consumers want. So we're pretty happy with what we have right now. Um, of course, in the future, you know, who knows? Anything is possible. Um, but uh, but uh, our, our, you know, if you look at our ingredient list today, you can see how much how much sugar there is in the product, um, and uh, and the taste has been well received by consumers. Um, when it comes to those kinds of sweeteners, I think one of the things that's really important for us at YoPlay is. Um, we have very clean label products, and we're very proud of the label. If you look at the ingredient list, it's a very simple ingredient list. Um, and if you look at uh, Peril Delay plain yogurt, it it's only has a few ingredients on the list. Um, and that's something that, again, that's what consumers value. As we've talked to consumers about the product and, um, and what's different versus the other products they buy today, as well as what do they want uh, for the future, that's something that, that simple label is something that's really important to them. And um, I think for I think certainly we'll work to continue that uh, that benefit. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope it was uh, hope it was interesting and useful. Thank you.